All right, today it says here, students, we'll be finding the inverse of a quadratic. You guys know inverses. We've talked about inverses before, so we'll take a closer look at those inverses, specifically with our quadratics. But before we get started on that, let's see how you did on your little warm-up here. You were given three quadratics, very similar to the ones that we did yesterday. So we're going to see which ones you got right and which ones we need a little help with. All right, so the first one, a, x squared plus 21 equals 70. Very similar to what we had yesterday using the square root method. The first thing I'm going to do is subtract 21. So 70 minus 21 was 49. And I need to take the square root of that 49 so that I can have x by itself. And the square root of 49, of course, is 7. But because we are working with a quadratic, we should have two solutions. So where's the other? That's right. Remember, we have both the positive and the negative root. So we should have both a positive 7 and a negative 7 for your answer. So that's what I was looking for on part A. How many of us got part A right? All right, very good. Uh, B is very similar to A. We're trying to get X by itself. So what I'm going to do is first add 12 to both sides. So now that gives me 4X squared is equal to uh, 13 plus 12 is going to be a... 25. Once we uh, add the 12, the next thing we're going to do is divide by 4. And what did you get? 25 divided by 4 was what? 6.25. 6.25. Uh, we're almost there. The next thing we need to do is take the square root of both sides. So if I take the square root of both sides, I'm going to be left with x equaling what? plus a negative 2.5. All right, so the two solutions here were 2.5 and negative 2.5. Now, just something real quick here, guys. Uh, when it comes to the answers, we can have it in both the decimal form or in the fraction form. 2.5. What would 2.5 be as a improper fraction? 5 over 2. 5 halves. So we could also have the answer written as positive and negative 5 over 2. So that is possible as well. I want to point out here, notice what we did was we took the square root of 6.25, which is the same thing as taking the square root of 25 over 4. And the square root of 25 is 5, and the square root of 4 is 2. So notice all we're doing is taking the square root of both the numerator and the denominator. That's all we're doing. All right, so how many of us got this answer correct on part B then? We're all pretty good. Here's the tricky one, C. Let's see how we did on C. Again, we're trying to solve for X. A couple of different ways that we can attack this. First thing I'm going to do is go ahead and take care of the 4. I'm going to subtract that 4. So 40 minus 4 was 36. But right now I've got X minus 3 squared is equal to 36. What would y'all do next? Square root. So now we're going to square root both sides. So over here we're going to have x minus 3. The square root and the square are going to cancel each other out. And what's the square root of 36? 6. Square root 36 is 6. Now what do I need to do? I'm solving for x. What do I need to do next? Plus 3. And 6 plus 3 is 9. So my solution is 9. However, this is a quadratic, so I'm supposed to have two answers. What's the other answer? Uh, plus and minus? How many agree plus and minus one? Nobody agrees with that? Oh, yeah. I've got one person that agrees with it. Anybody else? All right, guys, here's the deal. This is why this one's a little trickier. This right here is one of the solutions. Positive 9. However, the other solution is not, is not negative 9. Here's why. Over here, the reason we had both a positive 7 and a negative 7, over here on part B, the reason we had a positive 2.5 and a negative 2.5 was because we took the square root and we found both the positive root and the negative root. So if I take a look at C over here, when I took the square root of 36, I ended up with 6. But I didn't include that negative. What's the negative root of 36? 
negative 6. So we need to write another equation. So if you didn't do this, go ahead and add this formula. So we should have the other equation, x minus 3, is going to be equal to a negative 6. When I take the square root of 36, we have both a positive 6 and a negative 6. So notice what happens when I solve this. I add 3. Negative 6 plus 3 is a negative 3. All right, so the two solutions we have here are negative 3 and positive 9. And that's what I was looking for. How many of you answered that one correctly? That was three. We got a couple. Um, now, the way I worked it was algebraically. Was that the only way to do it? No. Anybody do a different method to come up with those solutions? What did you do? What did you do to come up with the answer? Graph it. That was another option. Remember, as long as you got it equal to zero, you can also graph it and find your x-intercept. There's nothing wrong with that. Is that cheating? No. That's one smart final way to find your solution. All right, so that's just a quick review of what you guys worked on yesterday. Now let's get to the nitty-gritty here. Uh, number one up at the top of your paper, it says a review of quadratic function. Now what we're going to be looking at is our quadratic pairing function. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to fill out that table. And at this point, most of you guys should be able to fill out that table without using a calculator. To find the y values, all we're going to do is take all of these x's over here and square. That's what the equation says to do. Take x's and square. All right, so here we go. If I square negative 3, what am I going to get? Hello? Negative 3. When you square? 9. Nine. What do you get when you square negative 2? 4. Four. Four. Square negative 1, you get 1, 0, 1, 4, and 9. We don't need a thinking calculator for that. We're smart enough. Okay, now that we got the table, now let's get its graph. So let's come over here and plot the points. Negative 3, 9 is our first order pair. So let's find negative 3, 9, way up here. Now I'm going to look for negative 2, positive 4, negative 1, positive 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 4, 3, 9. Once you get the points, go ahead and connect those dots. And you notice that we end up with our quadratic parent function. That's what we're going to be looking at today, quadratic parent function. All right, so we've taken care of part A. We've graphed it from uh, looking at the values in the table. Now let's answer part B over here. Part B, they ask us, if the domain of the equation is negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, and 3, then what would be the range? Well. What are the y values when we use these particular x values? What did we just get? What were the numbers? There it is. 9, 4, 1, 0, 1, 4, and 9. Those are the y values for those particular x values. C. Is this equation a function? Well, what was the function? It's up on the board if you forgot what's a function guys. Marissa, help us out. What's a function? It's on the board if you forgot. It's on our word wall. Function, function. Alright, so it's a set of uh, order pairs where the x values don't repeat. So can I call this a function? Yes. Explain. Why can we call this a function, guys? Because x doesn't repeat. So write that down for me. X does not repeat. X does not repeat. Now, just real quick, let me remind you of something else that we have to determine whether or not we have a function. And that's something called the vertical line test. Y'all remember talking about vertical line tests? How does vertical line test work? What's that, Marisa? As long as our vertical line, which is my green line here, as long as it touches the graph just once, it's considered to be a function. What if it touches twice? Then it's not a function. What if it touches three times? Not a function. So as long as we touch once, we're okay. We've got a function. All right, so that takes care of number one. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the inverse of that quadratic term function. Now let me remind you from first semester when we talk about inverses, all we're talking about is switching the x and the y coordinates. That's all we're going to do to find the inverse. We're just going to switch the x and the y. So if you look at the table we got on number one, 
All we're going to do is switch the x and y values. So now instead of negative 3, 9, now we're going to have 9, negative 3. Instead of having negative 2, 4, now we're going to have 4, negative 2. So all we're doing is switching the x and y. So basically all the y values are the x values now. So let's write those down. Here it is. Again, all we're doing is switching the x and the y. So now what I have is some new ordered pairs. What we're going to do is we're going to plot those new ordered pairs and see what kind of graph we get. So let's plot 9, negative 3. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Negative 3 is right here. 4, negative 2. It's right here. 1, negative 1. It's right here. 0, 0. 1, 1. 4, 2. 9, 3. Go ahead and connect those points. And here's my new graph. This right here is the graph of the inverse of that quadratic that we were looking at. All right, so I've taken care of part A. Part B, is the inverse a function? Can I call this thing a function, guys? No. Why? Explain to me why I can't call this a function. X is repeat, so make sure you include that one. X is repeat. Another way we can tell that it's not a function is using that vertical line test. Remember, if I run a vertical line across the graph and it touches more than once, then it's considered to be not a function, which in this case, that's what's happening. Notice how it's touching twice, which is why it's not a function. We've got an X that's repeating itself. So again, this is not a function. Now, another way we can find the inverse is by looking at the equation itself. So, the equation we started with was y equals x squared. Let's find the inverse algebraic. So, to do that, the first thing we're going to do is switch the x and the y. So, this y is now going to become x, and this x is now going to become y. So, we're switching the x and the y. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to solve for that y and see what equation we get. So let me go ahead and write it like this so it looks a little more familiar to you guys here. That's still the same thing. All I did was switch the y squared and the x. So let me ask you, if I want y by itself, what am I going to need to do to get y by itself? Square root. We're going to take the square root of both sides, which means that y is going to equal to the square root of x. Now the notation we're going to use, though, is f to the negative 1 of x. Okay, that implies that we're working with the inverse. So that little negative one right there is just saying that we are looking at the inverse. All right, so we've just completed algebraically how to find the inverse. So here's what I want you to do. Part B says we're going to go to our calculators and we're going to graph that equation that we just came up with. So before you do that, though, everybody go to Zoom on your calculator. If we mess with the windows the other day, I want to make sure we're all looking at the same graph. So go to Zoom and select number 6, standard window. Zoom 6. All right, now that you've adjusted your window, go to Y equals and type in that equation that we just got, which was square root of X. And whatever graph you see on your calculator, we're going to put it right over here in this little box. So graph what you see. So, on number two, when we graph the inverse, this over here is the graph that we got. That's what you drew over here, right? Huh? Is that the same thing you saw over there? No, what did you see? It's just the top part. What you're seeing on your calculator is this thing right here. You're not seeing the bottom half of the U shape. So, right here, does this graph match? Your answer from number two. No. No, it does not. Explain. Explain to me what you're looking at. What did we just say? What are we looking at, guys? The top half. So make sure you include that for me. And all we're looking for, or all we're looking at is the top half. We don't have the bottom half. And we'll talk about why we don't see that bottom half here in a minute. Maybe some of you already realize why we don't see that bottom half. 
But don't say anything yet. We'll talk about it in a minute. And over on the next page, it says these two relations are inverses of one another. Now, right now, all you're seeing is the quadratic parent function. The other graph that we got earlier was this one over here. So go ahead and draw that one because it's not on your page. Go ahead and draw that one. Now, let's go ahead and look at the parent function first. This graph that we have over here, the equation for that graph, of course, is y equals x squared. We're working with our parent function. What is the shape? What is that thing called? The U shape, or what do we call that U shape? A parabola. Now, we're going to be a little more specific because we do have two different parabolas that we're working with. So I'm going to call this one over here a vertical parabola. Vertical meaning that it's up and down. So this is the parent function. The inverse, which is this one over here that we got, what was the equation for this one over here? What's that? y squared equals x. That is correct. That's what gave us that graph right there. And what is the shape? Well, it's still a uh, parabola, but it's not a vertical parabola. This time it's a horizontal. All right, so we've got two problems, a vertical problem and a horizontal problem. Uh, let's see in the middle here. What are the properties of the inverses? Right there it says these, uh, their graphs are blank over the line blank. Now, remember we talked about inverses. What do we notice about inverses? How do we get from this first graph, the parent function, to this graph over here? What just happened to that graph? It reflected. I like that. Their graphs are reflections. But let's be careful. When we say they're reflection, reflection over what line? There you go. Y equals X. Now, I know it's been a while, but when we talked about inverse, we said there was a reflection over the line Y equals X, which is this line right here. So what we're looking at is a reflection that occurs over that line right there. Now, uh, why did I put yes? Over y equals. Okay. What did that come from? All right. Their equations have the blank switch. What was it that we switched to get the inverse? The x and the y. So what we did was we switched the x and the y to come up with the inverse. Now, if you look closely over here, it says, what's the problem with this graph? So we're looking at this one right here. What do we say about that particular graph? Here's a little hint. This graph is like a line. Give you the first. This graph is not. There you go. This graph is not a function. That's the problem with that. That is not a function. It fails a vertical line test which means it also has x's that repeat themselves. So that's the problem that we have with that particular graph. All right, so normally what we do is we just graph the top half. We're just going to graph the top half and call it the, what are we going to call this? Square root function. That's right. So all we're going to do is uh, graph the top half and call it the square root function, which makes sense when you type this in your calculator. The way we got that top half was by typing in the square root of x, which is why we're calling it the square root function. Now, you'll notice over here the square root parent function right here. To find values of table, if we take x's and square those, or not square them, but square root those x's, here's the y values that we get. So, for example, if I take the square root of 0, I get a 0. If I take the square root of 1, I get a 1. If I take the square root of 4, I get a 2. If I take the square root of 9, I get a 3. What would go next here? 16. If I take the square root of 16, I get a 4. What would be the next number? 25. If I take the square root of 25, I get a 5. So all we're doing is taking the square root of the x values. All right, so let's go ahead and take these 
order pairs, and plot them. See what we get. Zero zeros right here. One one. Uh, let's see, four two, nine three. Of course, sixteen four, twenty five five is not going to fit on our paper. That's okay. We got enough. Let's connect those dots. And here's the shape we get. This is the graph of our uh, square root parent function, which should look familiar to you guys because we've talked about the square root parent function. Now that we have that square root parent function, what would the domain of that graph be? What's the domain of that graph? Ah, there you go. That is correct. The x values are going to be anything greater than or equal to a zero. It says here you can only use blank values for blank. We can only use positive values for x. Maybe tell us why. How come we can only use positive values for x? Let me ask you another one. What would happen if I used a negative value for x? What would happen if I stuck a negative number right there? There you go. We would end up with an imaginary number. In other words, if I put that in the calculator, just like yesterday, we're going to get the error. So that's why the x's have to be positive values. Otherwise, we would get an error. Uh, what about the range? What are the y values on this graph here? What's that, Alicia? Greater than or equal to a zero. So notice the y values are also going to be positive values. It says here you will only get positive answers for y. Why? Why are we only going to get positive numbers? So we're taking the square root of positive numbers. So when you take the square root of positive numbers, you're going to get positive answers. All right, again, that's dealing with the parent function. All right, we're on the next page, number four, review of quadratic transformations. Here we have the equation y equals 2x squared minus 2. Now, obviously, that is a quadratic. So when I graph this, what kind of shape am I going to get? A U shape. So how are we going to get that U shape? Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to fill out this table over here. Now, we can do this by hand, or we can cheat a little bit and use the calculator. I'm going to go ahead and let you cheat today, and we're going to use our calculator. So everybody go to y equals, and let's do 2x squared minus 2. 2x squared minus 2. Go to your table, and let's complete the table we have on our worksheet here. So right next to negative 2, what y value do you see? 6. Right next to negative 1, you see a... 0, next to 0 you see a negative 2, next to 1 you see a 0, and next to 2 you see a 6. So all we did was put in the calculator to come up with these values. Now that we have those values, let's go ahead and plot each one of these and see what the graph looks like. So on your graph paper, let's find negative 2, positive 6, right here, negative 1, 0, right there, 0, negative 2, 1, 0, and 2, 6. When you get all your points, go ahead and connect them so you can take a look at your usual graph. Now, just to make sure we're on the right track here, guys, double check that with your calculator. Does the graph on your calculator look similar to what I have on the worksheet? Does it look okay? All right, so we're on the right track. So if we take a look at that graph, part B says, what kind of transformations? just occurred. Let's start with the negative 2 or the minus 2 at the end of the equation. This minus 2 right here. The transformations we have are still over here on the board. What exactly did that minus 2 do to our problem? It moved it down to you. So make sure you put that for me. So moving it down to you. What effect does 2, that coefficient, have on the graph. In other words, what is that 2 right there doing to our graph? Stretch, be more specific though. You're right, it's stretching it vertical. All right, so we're doing a vertical stretch. Now let's be even more specific. 
We're doing a vertical stretch by a factor of how much? Two. Remember we said the bigger that number is, the more we stretch it. And what happens the more we stretch it, the skinnier that graph is going to be. So we're stretching it by a factor of two, which is why it looks a little skinnier than our parent function. All right, so that right there is the quadratic y equals 2x squared minus 2. Now let's take a look at the inverse. So if we look at number 5 here, the first thing we're going to do is look at the table and get the inverse of that table. So we're going to switch the x and the y values. So now instead of negative 2, 6, now we're going to have 6, negative 2. Instead of negative 1, 0, now we have 0, negative 1. Now we have negative 2, 0, 0, 1, and 6, 2. So all we're doing to find the inverse is switching the x and the y. Now that we got that table, let's come over here and take a look at its graph. Let's find 6, negative 2 first, which is going to be right here. And then I'll find 0, negative 1, which is right here. Negative 2, 0, that's over here. 0, 1 and 6, 2. Go ahead and connect those points. And this is the graph we get. That is the graph of the inverse of that, or that quadratic we have. B is asking whether or not this graph here is a function. Is this considered a function? No. Why? Why is this one not a function? That's right. We have some x's that repeat right here. You can also tell that it's not a function using the vertical line. If I run my vertical line across there, notice how it's touching twice. And that's a big note. It's not a function. All right. Let's take this one step further. Now let's look at that same quadratic and let's look at its inverse algebraic. So if I want to find the inverse of that equation, the first thing I'm going to need to do is switch the x and the y. So this y right here is now the x, this x is now the y. Alright, so now I have x is equal to 2y squared minus 2. And what I want to do is I want to solve that for y. I want to know what the new equation is. Here we go. We're going to start by adding 2. So what I'm going to have here is x plus 2 equals 2y squared. All right, Jose, what do you think we're going to do next? If I'm trying to get y by itself, what would be the next move here? There you go. We're going to divide everything by 2. So that gets divided by 2, that gets divided by 2, and that gets divided by 2. By the way, don't forget, in front of that x, there is a 1. So I'm going to go ahead and write it down so you can see. So here's what I'm going to have at this point. I'm going to have 1 half x plus 1 equals y squared. We're almost there. And what's the next thing I need to do here? Square root. So we're going to take the square root of both sides, which is going to leave me with y equals square root of 1 half x plus 1. All of that 1 half x plus 1 needs to be underneath the square root. Now let me go ahead and use the same notation that we're using. The notation we're going to use is this right here. Remember, that little negative one just implies that we are looking at the inverse. That's what that little negative one is. All right, so this right here is the inverse function of what we started with, which was this right here. Let's graph that in our calculator and see what the graph looks like. Go to your calculators and let's type in the square root of 1 half x plus 1. And whatever you see, go ahead and graph it for me on the that little box over there. All right, Marissa, what are you noticing about B there? That graph that you just saw in your calculator. What do you notice? Does it look like like this one over here? Does it look similar to that one? All right, so it's basically the top part of this one over here. 
So when you graph this, you're looking at something that resembles this. Is that right? So once again, all you're looking at is the top half. So right below that, does this graph match your answer from number five? No. As Marissa just said, all we're looking at is the top half. Notice, however, that it, it is moved over to the left. All right, so that is number five. Um, now, on these two inverses that we graphed with the calculator, you'll notice that we're only getting the top half of the graph. Can anybody tell me why we're not seeing the bottom half? Has anybody figured it out yet? What do you guys think? Are you stretching or you got something you know what? It is a turn function, you're right. What if I wanted to see the bottom half? Is there a way that I could actually get the bottom half to show up? Here. Ah, remember guys, when you work with quadratics, let me just give you a simple example here. Let's say we had y squared equals 36, and I asked you guys to solve for y. We would take the square root of 36, and the square root of 36 is 6. But remember when we were working with quadratics, there's a positive root, and there's also a negative root. So it's positive 6 and negative 6. So what's happening here is we're only looking at the positive root. If we wanted to see the bottom half, guess what we're going to have to include? The negative root. Just for the fun of it, let's take a look at that. Go to your calculus. So let's go to y. Of course, you still have this in there, right? You still got your square root of 1 half x plus 1. Don't delete that. Go ahead and leave that on. What I want you to do is go to y2, and I want you to type in negative square root of 1 half x plus 1. So it's the same thing, just with a negative sign in front. And graph it and see what happens now. Now what do you see? Now you see the bottom half. So the only way you can actually get a U-shape that's sideways is by typing in two equations. There's no way to get it in there with this one. At least not with our calculator. Maybe with a different calculator you could. But in this case, that's it. You've got to type in both equations. So what you typed in was this right here. What did that negative sign do for you? Flipped it. Isn't that what a negative sign does? If you look at our transformations over here, that negative sign gives us a reflection over the x axis. So that's why you're seeing the top half being reflected across that x axis. That's what that negative sign right there is doing. All right. Just a little extra for you. What I want you to do now is that last page, number seven, very similar. What you're going to do for me first is fill out the table for that quadratic. You're going to graph it for me, and then you're going to tell me what kind of transformations occurred um, with that minus three and that minus one. Then you're going to give me the inverse, both the table and the graph, tell me whether it's a function or not. And then number nine, you're going to go ahead and give me the equation for the inverse. So basically the same thing we did together. I'm going to give you some time, and then we'll take a look at it. Um, together. So let me give you about five minutes to, to work on that on your own. The whole page, seven, eight, nine.
Okay, I know some of you guys are still working on it. What I'm going to do is while you guys are still working on it, I'm going to call a couple of you up here to share some of the answers that you came up with. All right, so. All right, guys, let's go ahead and take a look at number seven here. I know some of you still working on that number nine. We'll get to it. Uh, number seven, let's check the table. Notice the y values here are 8, 3, 0, negative 1, 0, 3, and 8, which is correct. And if we graph that, this is the U shape we get. This is our parabola. Now, if we take a look at the transformations itself, the minus 3, since that minus 3 is inside the parentheses, that moves the graph sideways. In this particular case, we're moving the graph three units to the right. Uh, the minus 1, the minus 1 is on the outside of the parentheses, therefore we're moving the graph down one unit. All right, so we're taking the parent function, moving it in the right 3, and down 1. So this is the graph we should get, which is correct. All of number 7 is right. So if there's something you don't have on number 7, make the correction. Um, now let's take a look at number 8, the inverse. All right, I'm going to go ahead and give me your numbers in your graph forms. Numbers in your graph Let's take a look at the inverse. Remember, inverse is just switching x and y values. All we're going to do on this. Okay, so there's the table. All we did was switch the x and the y's. So this is our new graph after we uh, switch the x and the y values. That's the graph of our inverse. So is this graph a function? The answer was no. And why is this one not a function? That's because we have some x's that repeat or that vertical line test. We don't pass that. All right, here's the one that's giving us a little trouble here, and that's to find the inverse algebra. So let's see how we did on this one. Um, I think most of you got the first part which is to switch the x and the y. So the y now becomes the x, 
and the x now becomes the y. I don't think there's any problems there. All right, so the first thing we're going to need to do is move the minus 1. So the opposite of subtracting 1 is to add. So what we should have here is x plus 1 equals y minus 3 squared. So there's your first step. Now here's where some of us are getting lost. What's the next step? What do we need to do next? Square root. The opposite of squaring is square root. So now I'm going to take the square root of both sides. Square root of that side, square root of that side. It's going to leave us with the square root of x plus 1 equals y minus 3. I'm almost there. Now I need to move the minus 3. The opposite of subtracting 3 is to add 3. Now again, here's another part we need to be very careful with. Of course, over here I have just the y equals, I am not going to add the 1 and the 3, guys. And the reason I can't add 1 and 3 is because 1 is underneath the square root. 3 is going to be on the outside of the square root. When I write this, we're going to have x plus 1, which is all underneath the square root, or the rest, plus 3 is on the outside. Now, just to make sure that I use the same notation, we're going to use that little negative 1. So this is the notation to describe this in first. All right, so this right here is the uh, equation for the inverse. No, again, notice how the plus 3 is on the outside of the square root. Now what I want you to do is put that in your calculator. We need to be very careful how we type this in. because That plus 3 needs to be on the outside of your rest. So when you get through typing in x plus 1, make sure you hit your little right arrow key so that the plus 3 ends up on the outside. And whatever we see, that's what we're going to graph in this little box over here. And what we should see is something that looks like this right here. So once again, just like the others that we saw earlier, all we're seeing is the top half of the graph. So down there where it says, does this graph match your answer on number 8? The answer again is no. All we're seeing is the uh, top half. Where is it? What would I have to do if I wanted to see the bottom half of that graph? And you have to type in the same equation on y2 with a negative in front. Okay? And inverse. Inverse. When we're working with inverses on the graph set, an inverse is a reflection over what line? What? Nope. Inverse. Inverse is a reflection over what line? Y equals X. It's that diagonal line. Okay, not over the X axis, not over the Y axis, but the diagonal line. All right, any questions? We're all good here. We're ready for the test. All right, guys, that is it.